Hey everyone, once again it's that time. Time for turning your brain into an ice block with Japanese cartoons. That's right, we're back for our second episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your hosts, CC and John. Today we're going to talk to you more in depth about a couple of shows we each watched last season. Though unlike last time's talk about One Punch Man, we're going to go our separate ways a bit this time and talk about a couple of different shows that we watched. Oh no. But before we get into uh, it's it's scary. It's scary. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Second episode and already separated. But before we get into talking about that, we're gonna dug into what we're dubbing our trash stash, where we're gonna talk about a show one or both of us tried to watch and thought, yeah, you know what? Think we're good. Don't need any more of that on the plate. So now we're gonna pull the janitorial duty. No, no. And talk about our trash stash. It had to come up, didn't it? It did. It did. Now the trash stash, as stated before, are shows where you know one of us it could be either of us if we want to bring up a show. Started watching it and decided, you know, not so great. Just kind of want to leave it right there and not watch it. Although, in the, in the future, maybe we'll talk about a show in the trash stash where we watched it beginning to end and we wondered what we did with our lives. Yeah. But this week, we're going to talk about some. We're going to try and stay recent for our trash stash for the time being. And we're going to talk about. Uh, Comet Lucifer. What were uh, what were your thoughts on it, CC? Yeah, I've only watched two episodes of it. Uh, like all the stuff we uh, review this season that aired in fall season 2015, and it looked interesting in the beginning because I, I kind of I don't know I liked the um, the location of that show, this weird I don't know semi Venetian city that it's set in. Mm, yeah, it did give off that vibe, like a very seaside town sort of thing. Yeah, it was I don't know felt felt interesting, and the the arch architecture was uh, nice, and uh, the style of the um, vehicles and everything they used in that show. I, I like that. That's what got me interested, and then it just I don't know. It turned into this kind of too generic checking off all boxes mech show uh that reminded me a lot about i don't know maybe eureka 7 and some other shows i don't know did you get the same feeling in the beginning uh i mean i don't know about eureka 7 but it was it seemed like a very by the numbers story at oh, first yeah. boy meets girl who we presume has you know lost her memories there's some organization out to get her. They run away from them, but suddenly there's this giant robot that they can't tell whose side it's on, whose side it's on, and it's fighting, you know, everything that comes its way. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense at first. Mm. And it's, you know, it's confusing for everyone. Uh, but I feel like that setup where. Not even the characters themselves, like none of them are sure about anything that's going on. I feel like that would start off a bit neat, but then I feel like it kind of petered out really quickly in the second episode, like you said. Like you already said, it felt like the show was trying to go by this very straight path that was, you know, paint by the numbers. Like we have to go, this is what needs to happen next, because it happens in all, uh, in all these mecha anime that we try to reference. And this has to happen next. And there... There weren't really any surprises in the first two episodes at all. And I don't know, the, the characters were kind of cardboard cutouts in some regards. And while, while not, you know, being annoying or anything or, or unsympathetic, at least not, uh, most of them, it's just none of them grabbed me. It was weird. Like, it's, the, the show just felt like a big pile of nothing to me. Even though stuff was happening, it wasn't it was not really engaging. The action scenes while not incompetent, didn't feel like very excitingly directed or anything. It just feels like a, I don't know, a weird blob of have seen this before, pass. So Yeah, I mean, the, the animation is done by 8-Bit, and mm -hmm. they've done, well, some of their shows are of 
dubious quality, not in animation terms, but you know, like they they worked on Infinite Stratus, so make make of that what you will. Whew. But their animation jobs are pretty solid, and I mean, you know, it, it came through very uh, vividly, and the colors are you know very bright and vibrant, unlike you know many other shows it just kind of stylistically grabbed me but that aside it didn't really leave a huge impression it had some decent uh music as far as i can remember it's uh done by tatsuya kato who's done uh some other shows i've watched like uh, prisma ilia medica box so he's worked on some uh good big name stuff as it were buddy complex as well we've, we've both watched buddy complex yeah and that was also, I don't know, that that show ended weirdly. Maybe we get to talk about it some other time. But yeah. that, that, that show started kind of promising, or at least, I don't know, I enjoyed it. The action was well-directed and everything, and the story set up with the time travel and everything was, was neat. And then it just ended on a fart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I assume they ran out of money or something and just had to you know, release the last two episodes in OVA form or something, because I assumed we would get a second season and it just was like two last episodes or 40 minutes. Or Which something. is weird, because I'm pretty sure Sunrise was saying, hey, there's going to be a second season of Buddy Complex, and it just kind of fell apart. Yeah, it was just a, over a long final episode. It was really weird. It felt like there was a lot of stuff left out. And Comet Lucifer is kind of... I don't know the opposite in regard that why body complex started strong <laughs> just comment lucifer had nothing interesting going for it at the beginning uh, there was a lot of interesting uh, stuff in there that should have been interesting but it just i don't know it it didn't grab me i mean another thing in common between the two shows is that they don't have any source material they're both you know original anime so i mean i wonder if they thought that they could just wing it as they went along well more so in comet lucifer because buddy complex i feel at least in its one season had a stronger narrative throughout what i don't get is just the uh, the lack of interesting stuff to look at in at some parts because the director apparently has is the director of macros frontier and that's an interesting looking show or oh, action scenes as well so i don't know what happened <laughs> <laughs> really it's just i don't know uh um, kind of con confusing case with Comet Lucifer because just from the plot synopsis that I read that I was like hey this this sounds like something I would be very interested in and then I literally dozed off in the first episode Oof. I had to watch the ending twice because I fell asleep <laughs> and I wasn't overly tired or anything and there was stuff happening on screen but I don't know super weird uh, yeah and the second episode didn't you know give me any incentive to keep watching uh very uh very strange i mean they introduced that creature that hangs out with philia that can like mm. change its form into the giant robot and i was like oh that's that's cute what so what yeah M mascot character but i don't know mascot character and turns into a giant hunk of metal and apparently turns into another form later on in the series i did some light reading on but i don't yeah. i don't know anything about that anyway uh don't don't recommend this one maybe it gets better in the later episode but it didn't hook me uh in the first two and usually i give an ep uh, a series three episodes to pull me in and then decide if if it's worth staying with it but this no no y yeah, I'm looking at uh, some of the community scores on these episode reviews, and they're not great. Yeah, and it's not like, like I, again, it's not like it's an offensive show or anything, or it got anything repulsive in it or that you know, makes you turn off. It's just, I don't know, it's a big pile of nothing, I would say. <laughs> just, you, you watch it for 20, ep uh, 20 minutes, and you're like, okay, I guess something happened in this show. <laughs> it's like, okay. All right. right. See ya. Mm. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the the fall season was kind of lacking in the mecha department, which is why I wanted to latch on to it. Yeah, definitely. But, but then I just ended up rewatching Macross Frontier, and I was like, hey, I feel great. Yeah.
<laughs> I mean, we we had the big other mecha uh, anime, which was uh, G Gundam, and that one is has been good. Well, yes, but or no, no wait, I finished uh, Macross before the start of the fall or the fall season, I believe. Never mind. Okay. So I guess I should say. I got my fix before then, and I just felt kind of let down. Me too. <laughs> and that's why it's in the trash stash. Pretty much nothing more to add to that. Well, we're going to switch over to shows we watched and we enjoyed and kept around till the end. So uh, let's do that. So then, we're going to talk about a show that you watched a little bit of, but I watched beginning to end. You know, a little something called Young Black Jack. Don't know if you've heard of him. It's a Tezuka character who... What? No, not, not at all. Never, ever. <laughs> uh, wait, even, even... Is, is this uh, the Young Black Jack manga? Uh, when, has that, uh, when has that started releasing? The first... or. The run for the Young Blackjack manga started in 2011, but apparently it only just got an adaptation this past year. So, so this particularly uh, particular form of uh, uh, Blackjack is new. It's just based on an older property and you know a prequel. Well, yeah, newer compared to the original 1973 to 83 run. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's of course, it's not the only blackjack adaptation into an anime there were several before like at least there were a couple of movies there was a series called blackjack 21 mm -hmm. what a topical <laughs> what a topical name for that yep <laughs> uh but this latest one ran you know, just this past fall season it was headed up by tezuka productions as you would expect yes it was Directed by a Mitsuko Kase, who has a bit on his plate. A lot of his, uh, well, one of his big claims to fame looks like here is he directed a few episodes of Gundam 0083. Mm. And he's done other work on Gundam as well. Uh, he did some directing and storyboarding on SPT Lasner, uh, Votoms, like a lot of big uh, robots. Uh, mecha stuff. Mm -hmm. Combatler Gyro Zetter Gs. It's written by... Uh, the original manga was written by Yoshiaki Tabata. He also did the script for the series as well. And the art was done by Yugo Okuma. Uh, from what I hear, I believe it was talked about on like the episode reviews on Anime News Network that there's some deviation or really not the same vision as the manga in some parts in the uh, anime. I mean, I can't say that for certain myself because I tried hunting down a little bit of the English language manga to make comparisons for myself, but as far as I can tell, there's no translated version, official or otherwise. So I, yeah, I, I'm not entirely certain whether or not to believe there's that much of a difference. I mean, I'm sure there are changes that happens with any show, let's be honest. So so what's the show about? I mean, for someone who hasn't basically... I mean, I know about Blackjack, but maybe some of our listeners don't, so... That's true. Wanna in, maybe want to introduce us to, a bit to that classic character? Well, Blackjack is uh, a doctor. Mm -hmm. He... Medicine doesn't... student in this one, right? He's yeah, not in a this... full doctor yet. Well, and the, well, I'm trying to paint, you know, the background a little bit. Yeah, sure. Early on, when he was the character was first introduced, you know, he's painted up to be this like rogue doctor because he never really got licensed or anything. So, all of his work is done like under the table. There's his intentions are well, but it's not always on the up and up. Is the problem? He can't, you know, go into a hospital and be like, hey, I'm just going to perform, you know, this, this, this operation. Because they'll be like, hey, you don't have the certifications to be here, get out. So he basically has his own private practice where he, you know, 
will take on any job that and no other doctors will because he's just that skilled. Young Blackjack turns the clock back quite a bit to when he was, you know, as you said, a medical student. And it takes place during, like, the era of the Vietnam War. So it kind of paints the image of this young student who just he wants to be a doctor. He wants to help people. And, I mean, in the first episode, they try to show that uh, Blackjack, or uh, before he be- is formally known as Blackjack, Hazama is his name, Hazama Kuro. Mm-hmm. They show that, you know, yeah, he's willing to help people out, you know, even though he's still a med student. Uh, he performs this operation on this man's son, and the man is willing to, you know, pay him very handsomely for his services. But when he finds out, oh, you're just a med student, you're not even licensed, he just takes the payment away, and that's basically ends up being the story of Hazama's life where he wants to help, but the realities of the world are very cruel. And isn't that something like that's uh, happening in his, you know, later life that he always asks for this immense amount of, of payment for, for, you know, for his, uh, for his work or I don't know, some other, some, some weird form yeah. of sometimes weird form of payment that is very, uh, I don't know, costly to uh to whoever you know requires his services but not always in a monetary sense I, i'm not sure if i remember that correctly because i have not seen anything of the uh old ova so um uh... i remember that being the case sometimes but more often than not it was you know large sums of money what was what he was going for because you know <laughs> to show the value of his work i think is what he was trying to drive at Okay, so this is this is basically they're trying to set the, I don't know, the ground for a work for that in in this show as well. Like this yeah. is where that came from. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, he still wants to help people, but he wants to, I guess, to make people aware of that his work is worth you know investing in. Yeah, no matter what his current status is, and uh, yeah. Even if he's not a full doctor yet, he has this, you know, better skills at certain doctors that are out there. So, yeah, that should be so, rewarded. I mean, a lot of young blackjack doesn't focus around his monetary gain. It just focuses around him helping people out where he can. And I think one of the problems with the show is that it seems like early on a lot of things are just happening around Hazama rather than things happening directly to him. Uh, Because he has this uh, doctor buddy, Yabu is his name. Mm -hmm. And Yabu has been through some shit because, you know, he's a war doctor. He's got, obviously has a ferocious case of PTSD, which is something that comes up a few times later on. Um, He's a drug addict too, right? Yeah, he is a, he starts off as a drug addict, and it's not, not a good time. <laughs> and he's, he's <laughs> also, yeah, he, some doctor, huh? Yeah. He's also shown to be very uh, skittish around, like, blood and viscera, and uh, which might be a byproduct of, uh, you know, being a war doctor. It's not super elaborated on in the show. Maybe it is in the manga. Again, something I would have liked to learn a bit more about. It's weird but... because, you know, as a doctor, <laughs> you should be able to deal with blood, like, in general. yeah. And, and I mean, they show him later on, he goes to Vietnam. I'm not going to go into too many details in case someone wants to watch it, but uh, he ends up going to Vietnam to help people, and he's like somehow gotten over it. But again, the details are missing. Like, how did he get over it? What it, was his motivation? You know, I, I don't know. There's things left out that don't really add up together one of the neat things about the show like the uh main opening theme is called i just want to be alive very thematically appropriate you know saving lives and whatnot there's one scene where yabu you know just looks at a body or a person i guess i should say that hazama is operating on and he kind of 
twice just shies away from it. But on the third time, you see him go back up to it, and he has this determined look on his face. And the lyrics in the song at that point are, gimme, gimme one more chance, which is mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, you know. It shows that he wants to change, and it's something that's reflected, you know, later on in the story. That's cool. Yeah. Again, you know, there was the theme of the uh, Vietnam War mm. throughout uh, much of the show. So you see a lot of stuff like uh, protesting and uh, talk, and them talking to, like, soldiers and whatnot, especially when Hazama goes to Vietnam. And one of them has, like, a very severe case, again, of, like, PTSD, paranoia and whatnot, because one of the characters with them is Vietnamese, and he just thinks they can't trust her and they have to keep an eye on this guy and when he and then he finally calls in like this airstrike on the camp that they're staying at just because he's that distrustful of them and he's just that you know caught in his own delusion of the war and it's it's a bad time and you know again it talks about it speaks to the horrors of like war and the experiences that people in that time and well, even now when uh, people get shipped off uh, overseas to fight for their country, have to deal with, and it, it, you know, it's understandably tough. Yeah, and it's um, it's it's interesting just in terms of how the series looks at certain events of that time and and people and uh, how they act, because what what put me off uh, in the show. Uh, was something that was happening very early on, you know, like like you said, there are, um, you know, there's uh, some stuff in regards to the Vietnam War shown, um, and one of the very first episodes, the first thing you see is uh, a student protest, medical students asking for, I don't know, fairer pay, pay uh, it was, I think, or better education or something like that. And the way the uh, protesters are portrayed is very weird, very one-sided. They are displayed as like money-grubbing um, assholes who only are out for their own gain and don't think of, you know, the patient's welfare first, mainly. Which is, you know, and Blackjack berates them for that because he doesn't want to have any part in their protests, uh, you know, when he is asked by them to participate. And the way these uh, the the protesters are portrayed just struck a a nerve with me because that felt really weird and and wrong to me. Um, it was it was very one sided and you know didn't didn't paint the conflict, uh, you know, of that time in in a, in a I don't know, in an objective light? I, I guess. I mean, it, it's hard to say because I don't know much about those protests, you know, in Japan at the time. Yeah. But, I mean, later on in the show, they cover the subject of, like, uh, civil rights protests in the Americas. And Blackjack Hazama gets to see firsthand, you know, these... Uh, like parades of civil rights, you know, in the street, just and them getting attacked by like law enforcement in the in the troubles that you know African Americans and whatnot had to deal with at the time. And there's this one guy in particular who just keeps getting beat to hell, but he won't stop protesting. And Hazma, you know, seems to be taken slightly aback by this, but he wants to get to the core of uh, a certain problem that this guy Johnny has as well. Again, try not to, you know, say too, too much about right. uh, what's going on with that particular part of the story. But there's, you know, a segment in there where Hosma gets too close to the truth and he has, he gets completely thrown off his path. So. All right. So they, I don't know, they, they try to get a, a bit more diverse in that regard, like try to, show both sides of certain conflicts and not just have it just this one-sided monologue <laughs> about uh, uh, a certain political stance or something. Yeah. Which it sounds like it. Be- and, and something, another thing that I was mentioning, and which finally made me actually cancel or just leave, drop the show, mm-hmm. um, was when uh, going back to Vietnam, uh, to the Vietnam subject, one of uh, two guys who deserted from the war... Uh, yeah, found, found refugee with uh, with a group of um, people who help deserters in Japan and get them I don't know new new IDs and everything, and the people who 
just because they are protesters against the Vietnam War and they, you know, don't think it's right and everything. And the way those people who help the deserters are painted is, again, they're painted with this weird, uh, nasty undertone that is very, I don't know, very vile. They, uh, the way the f their faces are contorted and everything, they look like villain, villains sometimes. And they're painted like they are only doing this again for their own gain, just for their own political agenda without thinking about the um, the characters who desert. That was, again, very, very weird uh, undertones in this in this show for me. A very, very weird political stances and uh, and commentary that I just that that didn't gel with me for some reason. That just put me put me off. <laughs> yeah, I could see people want to step away from this for that reason. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I wanted to stick with it because Blackjack is like one of my favorite Tezuka characters. So mm. that that was the big hook for me. Yeah, sure. And I'm not berating you for it or anything. I find it interesting. I just want to, you know, elaborate on why I couldn't stay with the show, because it just uh, it gave me a bit of a yucky feeling. <laughs> I don't know how to express it. It's just I was looking and it was like, this feels wrong to me. <laughs> I don't know if I want to see that. <laughs> there are some weird jarring moments like that. But I mean, I, I feel like it got a little better. All right. As it got towards the end. That's good to hear. You say he later gets to Vietnam, and without going much into spoilers, is there, an, aside from him becoming a doctor, is there an overarching plot that uh, you know gets a resolution at the end of the series, or is it mainly a case by case basis where Hazama stumbles uh, across um, you know different kinds of people who need his help and uh, who let him you know learn something revealing about the world he's living in? I mean, yeah, most of it is like a learning experience for Hazama. I mean, he meets a character when he's in Vietnam, Kitty, who is, uh, would become in the future Dr. Kiriko, otherwise known as the Death Doctor, who is more or less the, the opposite of uh, Blackjack. Uh, Kiriko's methodology... Does he just like kill his pa patients or...? <laughs> Well, here's the thing. Later on, Kiriko uh, finds that, you know, well, everyone's going to die anyway, so I'm just going to help my patients, you know, ease into their death, which is like, like, wow, wow, man, come on. <laughs> You're not giving anyone any hope. Blackjack is there to give more hope than you, even through, you know, his questionable methods. But he doesn't, you know, he, he, he doesn't kill people who don't, you know, ask him for it, right? He's right. just basically there to, I don't know, is euthanize the right word, I guess, I guess, yes. But, of course, this probably clashes immensely with, uh, you know, uh, Blackjack's world view. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right, so they set this up in uh, in, in this show as well? Uh, no, they just kind of touch on, oh, this is this guy. Mm. And they don't really kind of heavily say that he will eventually become this guy it's just you know he is the same character all right all right well that's interesting especially for people who are familiar with the uh with the older series uh a bit of a fan surf there but um i think another nice fan service is that um the narration that goes on you know like at some parts in like during the episode previews and episode intros uh is Blackjack's voice in all of the other series, Akio Otsuka. Mm -hmm. So he's like narrating his past to the viewer, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's nice. Um, so would you say, um, if you haven't seen any of the old Blackjack stuff, is it um, is there enough in the new show to get uh, you know new viewer uh, invested, or would you recommend you go you know watching the old stuff first? Uh, just so that you can make more of the characters in uh, in Young Blackjack, or doesn't it really matter? I think it's worth watching, like not all of the older stuff, but some of the older stuff to get a better grasp on uh, where his character is going. Because the way it's the way Young Blackjack frames it is not super great, especially because, like I said, there's a lot that's left out mm -hmm. that 
was is probably a lot more filled in by the manga. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I don't know how much of the manga in general they adapted, and maybe we'll get a second season. Um, we'll see. Uh, so, what uh, were your favorite characters in that show? Well, I mean, you know, I like Hazuma because you get to see him, you know, grow up and you know learn different things about the world around him. You know, not everything is so uh, black and white, if you nah. will. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Yabu and Kiriko, or Kiri as he's shown in Young Blackjack, you know, they're probably two of the other big standouts just because, well, Yabu isn't, I don't think it's really touched on in classic Blackjack, but Kiri at least is. So there's not much else to anchor it to the classic stuff, I feel. And uh, favorite episode? Got anything there or... Uh, I forget what number it is, but there's an episode, you know, where they're in Vietnam and Hazama and Kiri are operating on this soldier. And, you know, they have to get him out of the camp before it gets, you know, bombarded with an airstrike. And it's just a very dramatic, very tense uh, scene that I feel shows Hazama's dedication to his work very well. And it was just probably one of the more interesting ones in the series. Are you content with how the show wrapped up? Or uh, do you, you know, think that it would be nice to get a second season? Just, you know, in terms of continuing the story or... I don't know. I don't know about a second season, but maybe like an OVA or two just to, you know, again, fill in the cracks. So, John. Yeah. If you were a god, but almost nobody believed in you, what would you do to spread your name around? Mm, you know what? I think I'd find one unlucky sod, show him, you know, all my godly tricks, and then just vanish. And then he can, you know, he or she, excuse me, can tell everyone what they saw. Ah, a prophet. And no one will believe him because they'll think he's nuts. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me how that will work out for you in case you ever achieve godhood. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm very interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, however, the uh, the main character from the series I want to talk about today uh, has a bit of a different method because he's also uh, in regards to, uh, you know, achieving new followers. Uh, he is also a god, but, uh, you know, doesn't have his own temple, everything, and uh, not many people know him. Uh, his name is Yato, and uh, he is the Yato god. And he tries to gain followers by scribbling his name and uh, cell phone number on the walls of bathroom <laughs> stalls. What? And other public places. Uh, and uh, providing delivery services of stolen or lost things to whoever pays him the standard fee of 5 yen. Oh, well, so that, uh, that, that's kindly of him. Yeah, that is, well, it's, uh, it's rooted in uh, Japanese, uh, um, you know culture and religion but we get to that sometimes this also entails, uh, entails destroying monstrous forms of so-called ayakashi or phantoms who are a manifestation of uh, human emotions uh, gone bad so uh, basically some kind of ghosts trapped between our world and the afterlife on one of his jobs yato is looking for a lost cat called my lord for some reason and uh, <laughs> uh he's Basically, he stumbles over uh, one of our other main characters, uh, Hiyoriiki, who basically saves Yato, even if she probably didn't have to because he's a god, uh, from an oncoming truck. Because Yato just runs into the street because he sees the cat and tries to catch it. And, well, uh, one thing leads to another and uh, uh, Hiyori pushes him out of the way and gets hit by the truck. Oh. Uh, shit happens. Uh, <laughs> She's kind of surviving it, but from this moment on, her soul is constantly leaving her actual body in the most inopportune moments. Uh, so she's <laughs> she's half alive and half phantom, 
kind of. And uh, when in soul form, she has a tail, which in good old anime tradition makes her look like a cat girl. <laughs> and <laughs> also, if that one gets cut, she dies. So she has oh. to look out for that. Yeah. Uh, so she asks Yato to do everything in his power to reverse, uh, you know, this by paying him his five yen standard fee. And, uh, well, they stick together from that point on because she's, you know, she doesn't really have anyone to turn uh, uh, turn to to uh, fix that condition. Yeah, and the first thing they have to do is find Yato a new Shinki, or uh, translated sacred treasure or regalia, uh, which is basically a god's weapon in this uh, in this anime, in this world they created. Um, since uh, Yato's previous regalia left him, because he's kind of a bum, he, he, he's wearing like, like this training jersey and, and a weird torn up scarf. He has no money. He's basically living on the street uh, because he doesn't have his own temple and everything. And uh, uh, well, he's now without a weapon and basically powerless uh, if you know he encounters a, um, a dangerous phantom. So uh, this introduces uh, the third main member of our cast, Yukine, who is a lost spirit that Yato makes his new regalia um, to fight off a phantom. So, and this is the basic setup for the show. We got these three main characters. And even though we are introduced to a lot more in the course of the first season, it's very much about those three and their relationship, which was the biggest pull for me um, after, you know, the, the first episode, which looked incredibly good and got me hooked. But after that, it just turns to uh, the drama uh, that is built uh, around uh, Yato's and Yukina's relationship mainly. And it's excellent. And uh, its resolution, uh, without giving anything away, is one of the most satisfying and heart-wrenching moments I've ever seen in anime. It's just fantastic. I was on the brink of bawling my eyes out and loved every second of it. <laughs> so uh, if you love your drama and if you love your deep emotions, that show is for you. Um, one of the central themes of the series are emotions and what you know effect they can have on other people. And uh, the show conveys that very well to the viewer in a strong but not heavy-handed way it's very good in you know pulling back when it's ne when it needs to and uh yeah it's uh, or holding back and uh that's re really really good the last third of season one is filler which wasn't in the manga and while the final confrontation looks nice it doesn't really do much in terms of developing the characters especially since the same plot point is brought up again later in the regular material in season two you don't need to skip it but it's, you know, kind of inconsequential to the rest of the story. Season 2, which, you know, was the setup for me reviewing it, because that just aired in uh, fall season 2015, uh, dives deeper into the rest of the cast, which is an interesting cast. The first half is about Bishamon, uh, god of war, uh, to who we got introduced uh, in the first season, and who holds a grudge against Yato, and we finally get to know why exactly she holds that grudge. Uh, again, great emo uh, emotionally compelling character writing on that one. Uh, the interesting relationship building in the show is enough for 10 other shows sometimes. It's <laughs> wow. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's great stuff. Like so many complex, interesting characters to, you know, to, to uh, look at and to experience um, great stuff. Uh, the second half of the second season is a bit more focused on overlaying, overlaying plot and world building since it shows us a bit more of the realm of the gods and how it works. But we're also introduced to an interesting new set of characters and get to know a bit more about the relationship between Yato and one of his former regalias called Nora. Um, ah. Which is also, also yeah. <laughs> you see <laughs> where that name is coming from. Uh, yeah, Nora Gami means stray god, I believe. And uh, that is befitting to that character, Nora, but also to Yato himself. Um, I, I would have to give away major plot points uh, and, you know, stuff about Yato's past uh, to, you know, dive deeper into that, which I won't do. But um, he has, uh, they, they both have an interesting background and especially their relationship is, is uh, complicated and uh, interesting, especially, you know, in what it, uh, what it tries to mirror in regards to uh, our life, maybe. One thing I definitely want to mention is even though sh the show and its focus on religious theming are very much rooted in Japanese culture, mainly Shintoism, I guess, the anime has immense mainstream appeal because of its, you know, gorgeous designs, uh, the character writing I mentioned before, and uh, very well-directed action scenes. 
the show is produced by Studio Bones. <laughs> So the well direction action uh, directed action scenes are probably a given. I mean, you are familiar with Bones too. Oh yeah, mean? definitely. Uh, like Space Dandy, Full Des Metal Alchemist. Yeah, and uh, Eureka Seven, Wolf's Rain, and to an extent Cowboy Bebop. Though that was technically a Sunrise show. A lot of the staff from uh, that series went on to found Studio Bones. Great uh, catalog of series they worked on that are just. I don't know, some of my all-time favorites and uh, definitely shows I would recommend to everybody. So, yeah, they did another one with this one. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking at uh, the director, Kotaru Tamura's history here. It looks like this is the first show, or I guess pair of shows, really, that he's, you know, been the full director on. And he's done, like, a lot of individual episode stuff and like storyboarding yes. on a lot of other series though yeah he was mainly a storyboard artist apparently before this this is his first big gig as a leading director and he's doing a very good job i gotta say the show is based on the manga by arachi toka i assume that's a pseudonym and it's still uh, and the manga is still running so i hope we will get further seasons one thing that's probably of interest to you is uh since you know we we like to talk about music and anime uh and the composer for this one is Taku Iwasaki, who has done soundtracks for shows like Gurren Lagann, Gachaman Krauts. My uh, boy Iwasaki, he, what's <laughs> up? Bencho and the Kenshin OVAs. So uh, a lot of stunning work. And Norogami is no exception. Uh, the soundtrack is emitting a lot of atmosphere and character and does a fantastic job of uh, emphasizing the different aspects of the show, show's best moments. Not only the soundtrack, speaking of good music, the OPs or openings for the first and second season are probably two of my favorite anime openings, even though they're kind of different from each other. But yeah, I, uh, I like them a lot. And uh, definitely check those out. Uh, people uh, of you who who are into watching anime openings um <laughs> i'm always into watching anime openings because like uh, i they're the hook for me basically yeah yeah obviously that's how they uh, you know they are constructed usually oh I mean, yeah the first opening just in terms of animation is a bit low on the actual animation it basically shows off just the characters but i don't know it works uh, especially in terms of the the graphical style they used um the coloring is very subdued very simple yeah i don't know it just it just worked for me it just grabbed my attention and the second one has you know the better song and crazy animation in there as well so <laughs> an improvement yeah, in every way that that's kind of like um going back to our last uh, podcast talking about active raid how it has you know a good opening song but it's more establishing shots of the characters rather than yeah. like crazy over the top animation so i know active raid is slated for a second season already so maybe when it comes back it'll you know do the noragami route and have you know a much more intensely animated sequence Perhaps? Yeah, sure. And sometimes sometimes uh you know time to do the actual opening because there's always I don't know, it feels like there's a lot of work put into that uh or it needs a lot of work. Oh yeah. Uh, sometimes that's cut short and I don't know, shows just get scenes uh, uh from from the first episode in 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 their opening or just like we said very limited animation just because they didn't have time to work on that so it doesn't always have to be uh, for lack of i don't know direction quality or anything so yeah i know like uh, like some shows just start with a basically incomplete uh, opening sequence I remember, I don't know, was it the opening to Black Bullet? That evolved over many stages. Like, there were uh, four, four versions of that opening, I think. I thought there was just the two, but I think, like, four or five episodes, and they put in, like, the intended intro sequence. Oh, maybe it was that. Like, I, I know, think. with Fantasy Star this season, it's kind of unfortunate, but um, the intro sequence, like... A lot of what you see is stuff you see in the first thirty seconds of the first episode, mm. and it's oh yeah, yeah, I noticed that. It's kind of rough. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they will change that too, but maybe they I hope so. Else. What else? All right, um, the theming and uh, well, world of the show is very much rooted in uh, in Japanese religion and Shintoism and everything and religious lore. Uh, there are some in jokes, I guess. And if you're a bit lost on all of that, uh, you might want to check out the Anime News Network article, "The Legends Behind Noragami" by uh, Gabriella Akins. Uh, it's a neat primer on all the themes and you know stuff in that show that you might be lost on. Um, I found it interesting because <laughs> I, I, 
it's been a while since I read up on that stuff. So uh, just in terms of some of the characters and their naming, uh, the name dropping in that show, it just, you know, opens your eyes to a lot of, uh, of uh, things that uh, might be interesting to you when you are, you know, when you found yourself interested in that show. Oh, yeah, so, reading yeah. on, like, lore and backstories and whatnot is, you know, uh, like, based on actual lore is pretty cool, I always find. But that is not saying that you can't enjoy the show if you don't know anything about that stuff. Uh, the the first season does a very good job at easing you into the material, like uh, just setting up the basic ground rules, giving you a bit of names and term terminology that you maybe need to know. But I found myself not really confused uh, at any time by watching the show because if it had to explain something it did that very well and just only the necessary exposition so that it doesn't you know it doesn't overwhelm you it doesn't overwhelm you and doesn't doesn't halt the show like that doesn't doesn't make uh, the plot come to a grinding halt um, mm. i can recommend the show to anyone who likes comedy interesting characters great design and animation if you are into Japanese culture, there is probably uh, a lot of uh, interesting stuff in there for you as well. And um, I mean, if you are not, why are you watching anime? Uh, <laughs> just as a general question. God, uh, why would you watch anime? Ugh. Yeah, that, that's a good question too. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, first season does a very good job of, of easing you into it because it's mainly about the relationship between the three main characters and they're living in our world mostly and uh you know doing menial daily tasks so it's it's very relatable and aside from the giant monsters running around that they have to defeat occasionally and it only gets a bit crazier in regards of uh of the god stuff a bit later on and in the second half of season two so you have your time to uh you know get accustomed to all of this so yeah um definitely if you if what I just talked about or told you sounds remotely interesting to you, check it out. You will not regret it. <laughs> I, I, I guarantee it. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really... It's not that I wasn't interested in the show. It's that, you know, it wasn't really on my radar more than anything else. But, you know, hearing you talk about it now, I might have to might have to go check it out. You know, I knew you said it was uh, headed up by Bones. And I, I adore Bones. I think they do great work. Um, but I didn't realize that my boy Iwasaki was on the music. And I'm looking at the cast list and Jesus, Jesus, they got a lot. They got a lot of big names. Some familiars in there. There's so many that who I just, you know, look forward to hearing in every season. Yeah, I mean, that's that might also be uh, I'm not someone who, you know, chooses their series by uh, by cast or anything. Yeah, I, I try not to do that anymore. It. It's become it's become sort of a plus for me where, I you know I look at a director and the writer and mm -hmm. whatnot. And I should I'm, do that more often. I usually it, go by studio and and plot synopsis, and I guess that's that doesn't always you know. But yeah, uh, studio director, uh, orig sometimes original creator. Just sometimes they don't always have many credits to their name, but the cast is usually. I guess not really tertiary, tertiary, like quaternary sort of thing. Like, oh, hey, I get to hear such and such's voice in this show. I should check it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, tell me, who's your favorite in the cast? Uh, I mean, I I like the main three because just because they're interesting. Yato is hilarious. <laughs> just his <laughs> antics, the shit he pulls. Uh, just to get attention and everything, it's it's great. And uh, uh, Hiri is just this. She's sometimes a bit preoccupied and everything, and then uh, I don't know, uh, tends to forget that uh, that she is sometimes leaving her body behind, which is uh, hilarious too. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like uh, um, those two. And Yukina, the number three in the cast, is interesting because he doesn't start off as a very sympathetic character. Um, just the way you know of, of his origin and everything, and because he's 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 basically a kid. He's uh, he died when he was young, uh, very young, and uh, then got basically became uh, Yato's Regalia out of nowhere. So uh, that brings its own set of problems with it, which is basically the buttload of of uh, 
well, the biggest arc of the first season and the most interesting one. And uh, yeah, just again, I would say Yato is the funniest, Hiri is the most sympathetic, and uh, Yukine is the most interesting characters of those three. And yeah, I like those two. And the I guess the other big character I, I really enjoy is uh, Kofuku, which is um, uh, a god that is also introduced in season one. And she is the goddess of misfortune. Oh. And <laughs> she's she's just such a just a funny character and uh the way we are introduced to her the episode she's introduced in is hilarious and uh yeah that's that's one of it's, it's a fan favorite she and her, her her husband i think her her compatriot uh are just great great characters and very enjoyable so yeah th those those four to five i would say are my faves for now anyway <laughs> So, uh, like, what was your favorite episode or moment, you know, if if you don't want to give too much away? Yeah, um, well, in regards to the first season, like I already said, the climax of the, of the big arc, well, that depends on the relationship between Yato, Hyuri, and Yukine. Uh, that was very, very rewarding and, and satisfying and everything. And, uh, yeah, felt really good. And in the second season, favorite moment... Well, I guess the conclusion to the the first half was also again very emotionally rewarding and interesting, and uh, because you learn so much about the background of of Yato and Bishaman, and it was just just that set of episodes was so um, I don't know so interesting and thrilling and engaging. So uh, yeah, very much, very much my uh, those are my favorites definitely. Any other final thoughts? No, just a quick heads up for people who think, uh, who who wonder if they can start, uh, you know, start with the second season and skipping on the first one. I would not recommend it, because the second season heavily depends on, uh, you know, on you already uh, being familiar with the for, uh, with the set of main characters, and also uh, you shouldn't miss out on uh, the arc, uh, the big arc of the first season, in my opinion. So definitely check out the first uh, first season of Noragami before you check out the second. All right, that is a wrap on the second episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to virt.bandcamp.com and check out his music. It's awesome stuff. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter and animebrainfreeze.com. Leave us a comment anywhere you like. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you had a good time and please join us again on our next episode. Adios. See you later.